Greetings. We are on filming on location on board the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line. My name is Michael Woods. We're filming for Hamilton College and we're developing a jazz archive. My guest today is Norman Simmons, a very fine and well-traveled keyboard artist. Pleased to have you here. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I want to ask you this question. I think we kind of started in on it before, but uh, tell us how you got started playing the piano. Um, well, we had a piano in the house when I was young. We were, and actually I was born, uh, I was lucky because I was born in the Depression time. My father had his own business then, and we had a piano, and we had a Victrola. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the piano, um, as a matter of fact, we lived in the neighborhood where the Nat Kill family was. And uh, I don't remember them, but necessarily people would come back and play the piano, you know. And uh, we had a, an upright, Story and Clark upright, which was a player piano. A lot of gadgets on it, you know, pedals underneath. And uh, you could pull the, the little keyboard lid down. There's all kind of little levers in there that would do things, you know. So. I was playing under it at that particular time when I started, you know, and it was my like, a little rocket ship, you know. Uh, Buck Rogers was around during that time, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> that was before the real rockets, anyway. But anyway, um, I finally grew up to it and uh, learned to play little things on it, you know. I think maybe Coonshine was first. And uh, then listening to records, listening to the Duke Ellington, and like that, I began to pick out things on the piano. So I started playing by ear. Mm -hmm. The procedures, I worked myself up to something like uh, um, after hours. Had after hours in order to uh, black out. Um, I used to kind of imitate the Ellington band, and I remember uh, um, doing, I remember, but I can't remember the name, and um, one of his pieces. I mean, I used to go to school and play them. I was in the a cappella. And before the teacher would come in, I would, you know, play my little stuff on the piano. And of course, there was just a bevy of sopranos hanging around the piano. Uh -huh. <laughs> the plot thickens. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> it starts with popularity. Uh huh. And uh -huh. Uh, when I saw that, that encouraged you to go and learn a few more pieces. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then you discover other pianists in the school uh-huh and you go who else pop. is there in my particular school no one in particular that I remember you know in my neighborhood I grew up uh, that was a guy uh, Earl Thomas all of his family his father was like our community leader and his house was like the community center uh-huh they had about um, seven or nine children in the family which you understand that um, when each one of them had visitors to come by, they could uh, load the house up. So the, the ground floor, they had like a brownstone, three stories. The ground floor had nothing on it. That was our community center. But it had a piano, you know, maybe an old raggedy couch, piece of lawn furniture. Uh -huh. and, uh, and we could hang it. In those days, I stayed out, and I was like 13 years old. I stay out as uh, long as I did my work at home, but my mother signed me. I st we stayed out all night. We can hang out on his front porch, and and uh, and so he was kind of an influence because I started by ear, but then he started taking music down to Chicago School of Music, uh -huh. and that caused me to want to go down there. All of his sisters were given his sisters and brothers. They were all given music lessons. You know, so their family brought them, the father was a postman, brought them up that way, and they all were musical. How old were you when you started to learn how to read music? Now, that's an embarrassing question. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it that way, but I, well, I'm, I'm reading, getting that something. I'm getting that something. Reading is, reading is, is, is something because... Um, You know, it's a funny thing. I have to mention this about reading. It's something that I discovered. You know, and I don't. It's and, and I think it's still today. When you're playing the piano, they don't teach you how to read. You know, and so that's one thing that I begin to learn that I try to teach myself is what reading really is. 
So when I started to taking lessons, for instance, um, if you can call that uh, learning to read, I was about 14 years old when I finally started to taking some lessons down at the Chicago School of Music. And uh, reading is something just sort of built into your lessons that become, um, that you sort of take on gradually. And I say that I didn't learn to read then because immediately, since I had started playing by ear, uh, music was, the minute I read the notes to see what it was, it was absorbed. That's what I wanted to get at because uh, most of the musicians I know who started learning music by ear, they hear a sound that they like or an artist that they like that's producing a sound that they're drawn to. And then they try to reproduce that sound. Uh, and for instance, like when I coached, my, I coached the Black Gospel Choir for years, yes. they couldn't read notes. But any line I could sing to them, they could sing it back with all the inflections in there. Yes. And so, well, you know, I feel that sometimes when you learn that way, your ability to express is deeper. Definitely. Because when I learned, I, I, I was, don't feel bad, I was up in my 20s when I learned how to read music. Well, I, I was getting around <laughs> to that part, too. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, when, you, when you have the page in front of you, you know, sometimes the emphasis seems to be that of execution rather than expression. The, how you described uh, those people that learn by ear, to me, uh, that is uh, a primary element. Because to me, in music, the ear is number one. Mm -hmm. Number one. And um, even some of our great classical composers sort of played by ear. Mm -hmm. So the ear is number one. And as I say, because even reading music, is a form of memory. Mm -hmm. So consequently, the idea is if you have this ability to, 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 to absorb a tone, repeat it, be able to repeat it and, and retain it, then uh, being taught to read can be easier. Mm -hmm. Now I want to ask you, uh, I've noticed on your resume that you've played with some incredible artists. And uh, we're going to try to focus in a little bit on Joe Williams because some of this documentary is built around him. But I've noticed that you also, last night particularly, uh, in your show behind Joe, you're such a fine accompanist. Uh, you seem to understand how to play so sensitively behind a singer. Uh, tell me what it's like backing up a guy like Joe. What, how, how, tell us about playing that role of playing the piano behind a vocalist like that? Well, I'll go back to the beginning, because to me, everything goes back to kindergarten. Somewhere. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, listening to Duke Ellington, the one thing that I noticed, as I said, that I, I tried to imitate his band on the piano, and I noticed right away the individuality of the people in his, in his group, the soloists. Uh -huh and how the music was written around them. Uh -huh. And to me, I orchestrate for one thing. Okay. It gives me that lead voice and it frees me to orchestrate because this lead voice is taking care of the melodic part and then I can do composition in the back. Uh -huh. And that's the basic concept. When it became officially, officially accompaniment, because I was accompanied before with sensitivity, but Carmen McRae explained to me and laid down the foundations, which I now can like theoretically explain what accompaniment really does, how it works, and what it is. She me because she plays the piano too, and mm -hmm. when I joined her, she explained to me what it was, and and that that's what I use basically. So Joe is very easy to accompany because, uh, because I know this, I guess I accompany most people very well for that simple reason because uh, you're doing an instant arrangement and you're already deciding where it should go based on what the person is doing, where to increase the emotion, where to diminish the emotion, you know, uh, how their breathing is, you know, where the mm -hmm. phrasing is. Mm -hmm and you begin to orchestrate accordingly like that. And uh, 
but someone what makes it come out so good is that also when you have a great artist they deliver that information to you uh-huh uh-huh you know so uh they are making they're making it easy for you because they are so formulated this they're so what they where they are going and how they want to feel is so definitely delivered just like you pick up an artist i pick it up there and and it, and it, that's what allows me to really allow you to bring it to another level a really uh -huh. great level is a great artist uh -huh. i wanted to uh, say this i saw you know your performance last night with joe and it seemed to me like there was just marvelous levels of unspoken communication going on on that stage and uh, just the way you all played together the dynamic levels little fluctuations in the tempos mm -hmm. uh, some of the intros that the time just seemed to float until you wanted it locked in to a specific beat mm -hmm. you know uh, how many years does it take to learn to do that? And if, if there was a young keyboard artist coming up today, what would you tell them to how to learn to do some of these things? Well, it's a funny thing. A young keyboard artist approached me with a question similar to that. And uh, he said, you know, how do I get to that point? And it was a very simple answer. Time. <laughs> <laughs> you mean there's no you shortcuts? Know? Well, because as you go along in life, you know, and music is an expression of, of, of all the things that we are in your history, your techniques and stuff, as you begin to compile them, you know, uh, as much as people know, you just can't know all of these things until you've had some time not only just to have heard about them, but in some kind of way, delve yourself in them, you know, because it's an emotional thing. And uh, you just can't totally express things that you are unfamiliar with. It takes time for you to come in contact with the experience mm -hmm. to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, as you know, a lot of things we delve, like gospel, uh -huh. you know, this is something that they, they understand, or classical. And then you switch them to another, um, uh, area and and they don't have the feel for it uh-huh you know L let me talk to you about uh, playing the piano in a gospel setting because uh i teach a course on the history of jazz yes and uh, i tell many of the students i said if you attempt to fully and completely understand jazz but you know nothing about the black church you're going to miss something because some of that feel that comes, like you're talking about the, 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 the church, the black church is the center of the, the whole African American community. Yes. And a lot of us started in church, myself included. And, uh, and that feel is still there where, uh, and I'm going to explain it this way and then I want to hear your input on it, where the emotional content of the music is far more important than the objective design. For instance, if a, if, if a soprano is singing uh, a well-known hymn, uh, let's say Amazing Grace, mm -hmm. and you go to church, you say, I don't want to just hear the melody. I already knew the melody when it came. I want to know how you feel about it. Mm -hmm. Tell us your, some, one of your experiences that you, you got from playing gospel music or listening to it or uh, including it in, in, in your sounds that you now deliver. I, that's, now that may be, that's very difficult for me to try to reach and try to tell you specifically uh, what that is necessarily. Um, I may be still in the process of trying to analyze that myself um, because uh, sometimes we used to like to say we had it naturally. And sometimes I find that uh, it is part of our experience. There are things that are built in that help you with that. Uh, sometimes it doesn't come totally naturally. And yet and still, by being in that community where that's happening, that's how you get it. And uh, uh, the, you know, that goes back a long ways in the history of uh, the African-American when they first began to improvise the music. 
So that's something that, that goes even back further than, uh, uh, I guess, the gospel church. You know, I read Southern's book. Uh, what was her name? Eileen Southern. Eileen Southern's book. And then she was very uh, kind of descriptive about that in the beginning about how when they were all in the Protestant church and stuff like that, how they just automatically uh, improvise some of the standard stuff. You know, because I guess the way they sort of chanted from where they came from, mm -hmm. these straight notes didn't satisfy something, you know, so they had to take them and write in this feeling. And also the rhythm, something I began to notice too, is that I began to look at, even on television, and when I see the Africans dance, they're still using the afterbeat rather than the downbeat. Uh-huh, uh-huh. They, they got that little extra beat in there uh -huh. when they dance, you know, that was not in the European experience. And this affects the feeling of the music a great deal. Uh -huh. And when I try to get people to get the feeling in there, that is one thing I try to get them into is the afterbeat. Uh-huh. Because that's the beat that frees you. And this is one of the things I think that frees the improvisation is the afterbeat. Uh -huh. Because that first beat is so strong and so dominating that once you hit it, it tends to stop everything. It's not a starting beat. It's a stopping beat. Uh -huh. So when you come down on that beat, everything, everything just lays. It doesn't come up again. So, so uh, to me, this is where our Soxon was represented. It takes the emphasis off the first beat, and then it evens the beats out. It doesn't make the, the second beat heavier. It just takes that heaviness out of the downbeat. Uh huh. You know, and that sort of frees you. That makes you float a lot more. That allows so information I mean, to right. flow better. That's right. So if you play that, when I do it with singers and I make them do the afterbeat, a lot of them cannot sing and pop their fingers. Uh huh. But if they can do that, and they have to relate to where this is falling, it changes everything immediately. Immediately, it changes everything. You know, I, I was going to say in jazz, you know, one of the most subtle parameters is that of what happens to the time continuum. You know, so the fact that you're saying that the, the second beat, by putting the emphasis to the second beat and allowing the first beat to feel as though it's implied rather than stated, yeah. allows information to flow over longer, of, longer periods without it having to be punctuated all the time. That's right. You know, then another thing I'd like you to talk about, because I heard you doing this in, in your play. But the other thing night, you just mentioned, rhythm. And, and I heard uh, Winter Marcellus capsulize this on one of his things, that the next thing in the line is rhythmical improvisation. That's what I was there getting at. <laughs> rhythmical Talk improvisation, you know. And it's the same thing. Once you get into the afterbeat thing, it influences, you know, because a lot of songs are written with this pentameter where it arrives on these beats, you know. And once you move that out of the way, you have to improvise. Now the other thing now is to take the sentence and give it a rhythm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and already you, you're on the alternate beat. So it's demanding something from you already. Now how do you find that a lot of times? Uh, vocally you find it, you can find it in the lyric. Uh -huh. You know, once you begin to understand uh, uh, the same thing in the emotional thing that I find with the emotional players. And I'm from Chicago, which is a blues place. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that chain right from the gospel goes right into the blues. And so you find that same kind of emotion there. And uh, so the point is in the phrase, there always seems to be a part of it that is more important than the others. And this creates a shading. The part that you seem to emphasize, huh? where, the, mm -hmm. where the yell is, uh -huh. you know what I mean? Makes everything else fall differently. Uh -huh. You know, so that's the thing about it. There's the point in the phrase that begins to be more important than the other points that create this emotional feeling. Uh -huh. And when you can realize some point in what you're trying to do, where you're going, has an arriving point, and every other, other parts have a sort of a, an approach. You know, I happen to notice that even Ahmed's playing like that when I used to listen to his playing. He had, you know, and in, in Chicago a lot, there was that going places, uh -huh. you know, as opposed to everything being important along the way. Uh huh. In other you words, know. there was a hierarchy. Sometimes the volume was more important, or sometimes the tone, in the tone phrase, color was more important? It was sort of, I would say, the note. And then everything goes with the note. 
you know. I would tell them lyrically, in a, in a sentence, there's probably only one word per phrase that is the most important word. And everything sort of leads to that. When you realize what that is, that'll cause you to make the decision of, of where and when I'm going to place this word with, at what volume. So if, if, the, ly if the lyric line is as such that this particular word, the way he wrote it, is in a low pitch, you may need to move it to another space. Well, that changes the whole line of how you get there. You know, if you want this to stand out. Also because, you know, in the diction of Carmen, with Carmen's, Carmen's diction, this is, uh, she was like that in her expression. You know, she was very particular about her diction. And even though everything else was very clean, Carmen, it evoked emotion from people because she simply was able to choose a word and just sort of stab it right into you, <laughs> you know? And it's this comparison that allows you to hear everything else. And I had a lot of people who would come off the stage and she'd say, you know, I heard that song a lot of times, but I never really heard the lyric. Because you don't create this contrast that keeps your ear hearing, uh -huh. you know? Uh -huh. Like the silence uh, in certain spots you do, so that you set it up so that here's where I'm, here's where I'm going so that you can feel yourself get it. But everything is of equal. Uh -huh. equal value, then you tend to lose a lot of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. or, or you take information for granted. Yeah, like when we, even in singing, you know, uh, uh, our students to sing something, they'll be singing ta 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 I say, nothing goes like that. You know, when we used to sing like scuba doo ba doo ba doo ba you know what I mean? Which every other line, is, every other note is kind of shaded, even in bebop, where there mm -hmm. is that evenness. Uh -huh. You know, still they're shading things. Uh -huh. It's just a, a quicker vibration. Uh -huh. But in the other forms of music, it was much more ill you do. Skill you do, do, boom, boom, yay. You know what I mean? Oh, so there's a syncopation that's happening inside the line. Bow, ooh, you do, 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 you know? And a lot so of you're ghosting some of them notes. That's right, yeah, you know what I mean? You have to know which ones are important and not, uh -huh. you know what I mean? And, uh -huh. that, and that in itself creates a r rhythmical feeling, uh -huh. you know, when you're able to make those choices. Now, I want to ask you something. When you're talking about, you're talking about ghosting notes here and you're talking about the shading. Uh, I want to ask you, doesn't that take a tremendous amount of technique on a piano? Because on a saxophone, you're dealing with your own uh, wind pressure against the mouthpiece. Right. You can get all types of articulations by how you use your embouchure. Mm -hmm. On a guitar, you can bend the string, or you can put vibrato on it like B.B. King does. But on a piano, a piano is a digital instrument. And mechanical. And mechanical. So uh, give us a little idea of how you go about accomplishing that. How do you impose your will over this digital thing? I've often wondered about that over this instrument because I can listen to these players, Ama Jamal and uh, Hank Jones, Tommy Flanagan, and hear them. And after all of these gears that have to work when you touch this thing, they can still deliver their personality through there. And... Uh, but for me, and maybe some other players uh, also, uh, and in your imagination too, that's the other thing about, about the instrument, uh, would be the same thing, say for instance, when I went to music, if I just heard maybe uh, these little piano books or whatever he was getting me, then the piano would sound like a piano. But you see, I'm not hearing piano. I'm playing the piano. Uh -huh. So consequently, uh, I came up in a saxophone, saxophone era, so a lot of things that I'm doing are saxophone, for instance, or uh -huh. maybe a whole trumpet section. Uh huh. You understand? And so consequently, I go after the instrument to try to draw those effects out. I may be doing guitar sometimes when I'm playing the blues. Uh huh. You know? We were talking about uh, Dave McKenna, who was on the boat last night, who is a master of playing the bass line. Uh -huh. And... Uh, Mike Renzi, who all, also is on the boat, he's on as a passenger right now, but Mike is a great arranger, done a lot for singers. He's a great jazz player. He played, was on here with Mel Torme when Mel got, got married. He's a great man. We were talking about Dave McKenna and the fact that he is such a master of playing. Guys play bass lines, but it's the same thing. Theirs don't sound right, but he was sitting there <laughs> playing right then. And the thing is, the bass fiddle doesn't have this aggressive approach at the piano. You know, so sometimes when he's playing his bass line, it, it's not thunderous. It's just underlaying. 
Mm -hmm. You know, like so. You when you when, if I go down to play a bass note, I want it to sound like a bass fiddle. So I just draw the sound out. I don't try to get boom. I right. just say oh. Mm. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? You get that touch. So his is just humming down there, and so you can hear the top of what he's saying. That there's two levels going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, piano players they're playing these bass lines. So it sounds like a piano. Don don ding don ding don don don. Uh -huh. And he said, oh, way, uh, way, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? And so you can just feel that vibration that that emotional part of the string instrument gives you. And that's what you're trying to get out of the instrument, out of the piano, not these individual, all these note strings, but this linear, just one string that thing, something that's coming out of, you know? You're talking about uh, a person with great interpretive abilities and great conceptual abilities. Well, I think that's what we're saying in imagination. In imagination, you can be hearing something else. It's coming out of your instrument, but in your imagination, you listen to Joe, and it's a good example, and he explains it sometime on the stage. What he is, uh, what he's saying is coming out as a voice, but uh, well, he can explain it in voice, like when he came up, he's saying, he, he's listening to the choir, and he's singing all the parts, the soprano part, and the, you know? <laughs> uh -huh. So the point is they wonder about, in your imagination, well, his high notes and stuff like that, that's because he thinks that way. He doesn't think about this one range of where the baritone, he goes up and becomes a soprano. And that keeps that part alive because in his imagination, it's really alive, you know? Or when he imitates a trumpet. If you hear John Hendricks do this, it's so authentic. Well, they don't confine the voice. They begin to understand that the voice can do a lot of things. You know, we, and that's again the idea of looking at music as specifically music only. Uh -huh. I did a seminar, uh, we went over, I went over with Rufus Reed and a bunch of other musicians to Australia. And uh, I had the vocal department, you know. Um, my claim to fame over there is all of the other instructors used to come by because the vocal department was full of ladies. <laughs> but uh, it was two teachers there, one of them, uh, Judy, I don't, maybe it was not Judy Bailey in Australia, but uh, somebody that I knew of, it. she plays piano and sings, and she was the other instructor. When we opened up, we had everybody together for the opening lecture. And she brought in a record of Danny Kaye. And the same thing, she wanted them to understand what the voice could really do. And I'm still looking for that record. Let people look up and get it for me. But she put that record on, and Danny Kay did so many things with his voice, imitated so many things, so they can free them from this idea of just singing these notes. Mm -hmm. You know? So this is the same thing. We go back again to uh, the gospel singer. You understand? Because if I can put it this way, in the jungle you've got all these birds making these sounds, and this is what they've learned. Mm -hmm. This is what they have built into their voice, and when the note from one point to the other can take them there's the imagination right away to recall, and many times that's what it represents. It reminds you of something else. Yes. Yes. You know, and in their tradition, all of these sounds that was going that you recognize, the trees blowing, or, or monkey squealing, or whatever, they, they had all that in their vocal repertoire. And all of it comes through. The notes are the opportunity. They can kind of remind you of that as they go there. And that just took them back home. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> you know? I would like to ask you a question now about, uh, have you had an occasion to work with Count Basie at all? And uh, then, if you, even if you haven't worked with him, can you tell us how his style of keyboard playing helped that rhythm section? Everybody talks about that being the big band rhythm section. The Basie band, of course, you know, Basie plays piano. And... Uh, during the period of time when Basie, when Joe, well, Joe has always gone back as the prodigal son, but during the time that I became regular with him, uh, Basie would always show Joe, why don't you bring your own piano player? You know, because everybody else does. Joe didn't bring his piano player because he was the prodigal son. So when he went there, he went home. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he started even taking me, but I didn't get a chance to play. <laughs> you know, he would bring me, I'd stand in the wings. Uh -huh. It's not until Basie, I think until after Basie passed that I began to then play in the band, which was a good experience. Because Basie's thing, and the same thing uh, when we talk about on the stage and the, the communication, this is something I learned too, Basie and Duke. You know, I had to begin to realize that when I'm sitting at the piano, the same way I'm getting it from Joe, 
we can't, I can't holler across the piano to tell the musicians what I want. I had to learn how to play it in the playing. This is, and so it's the same thing. And Basie made the same kind of adjustment in his band that uh, Ahmed made with his group, because Ahmed is a great pianist too. But when he put that group together with Vernel Fournier, it was their talent that, that formulated that style that helped to conquer, because, you know, Ahmed was a definite style prior to that. But when they began to do what they do, Ahmed left space for them to do it. Uh-huh. You know? Miles picked that up. He uh -huh. comes in, he sets the pace, he commands where it's going to go, then he lets them go. Uh -huh. Ahmed comes in and he makes the statement, you know, the difference is it was just a rhythm section. You know? And then to me, that's the other thing with me all the time, even when I sit down and play solo piano. I don't think of myself as a piano player, I think of myself as a rhythm section. Okay. So that's an imagination thing again, you know, as a rhythm section. So this is what I think about basically underneath all the time is the rhythm section. You know, so you're sitting there and you, you're creating these rhythms and the rhythm and the pulse that's going on. And this is a lot of times what you're playing with. You're playing with this pulse and you're making this pulse breathe. You, you're laying this pulse against whatever is going on out there you know, and affecting it with just, just this pulse thing, you know. So Ahmed and, uh, and all of them basically had that where they could sit down and deliver that kind of information uh, uh, to the band. That was another definition that um, I just read uh, Joseph Campbell, and I have one of his books. I want to get his thing on myths and stuff like that. Very profound stuff. But uh, he explained that an artist is a technique. An artist is a technique. And that is to say that, uh, you know, that, you know, the way you can bring a sound mystical arrangement into Basie or uh, Quincy Jones, and uh, when they play it, he's going to make it come out Basie. Uh huh. You understand <laughs> what I mean? Because it, there's an understanding there. So when he is there, uh, the way he's going to set it up, there's a concept that he has that is a technique that, it, that, that, that this band formulates. And when everybody comes in there, they find out about this, and everybody sort of melts into it. Uh -huh. But it is, in, it is in him. There's this technique of, of, of a lot of things. There's no telling what it is. Part of it is, is the dancing, you know? And the descriptions of the band has to dance. And you'd be surprised when you lead it and you conceive all these things, your experiences, a lot of times the sidemen haven't taken time to conceive all these things because they're not responsible for getting a check from the guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you have to meet the man and pay everybody, you start considering how the band expresses. And uh -huh. pretty soon this becomes knowledge that you have that all of a sudden it becomes a technique. Uh -huh. And when you see it as successful, you begin to retain these ideas that succeed, uh -huh. you know? And so uh, all of a sudden, the same thing. Basie was, um, you know, of course, Kansas City and the blues and the feeling was there. So that part is incorporated in the band, you know? But he had the ability to, at some particular time, and I would attribute this, because the secret, I think, is Freddie Green. Okay. You understand what I mean? Uh -huh. But Basie said, hey, I got to let this happen. Uh-huh. You understand know I me? Mean? Okay. I okay. had to let this happen, you know. I'm just going to come in and sort of just urge it on at okay, times, uh -huh. you know what I mean, or keep the band together. But this is where we lay. This is what, this is that, that main pulse underneath that everything is going against. I want to ask you something about Freddie Green real quick. Now, you know, Freddie Green played that unamplified guitar. Yes. And he just chunked them chords in there. Mm -hmm. But the sound of that unamplified guitar was a very soft sound. If Basie had hit the same chords that many times on the keyboard, it would have been an obtrusive sound. But he knew, he said, if I can get that sound very subtle to kind of just chunk along under the band, and then I just color over top of it. Well, let me tell you something else, too. Uh, and it also had to be expressed. I remember reading something about the, uh, the Duke Ellington Orchestra that they were uh, Duke Ellington music they was doing down in uh, in Washington D.C. in the archives down there, and um, 
the guy that was leading the band, his name doesn't come to me immediately right now, I had to explain to them. To my Dave Baker? No, it wasn't David at this particular time. Gunther uh, Schuller. Gunther Schuller. Gunther Gunther Schuller. Schuller. Okay. Had to explain to that band at the time that, that they understand. You see, the Basie band, for instance, and the Duke Ellington band, that was one of the first thing I noticed, is that swing of the band did not rest on the rhythm section. That underlying, that separation of the two. You see, and that's what they really, in other words, the horns swung by themselves. Yeah. Uh-huh. You see? Okay. And so consequently, so a lot of times we get in the big band, and the, the big band drummer seems to take over. And Joe has to explain that a lot of times, because he, he's out of the basic college. Mm-hmm. And mm -hmm. so he'd tell the drummers, you know, I seen Frank West do the same thing. Hey, don't catch everything. Just sit down, lay it down, and let the horns play. Uh huh. You know what I mean? You don't have to hit everything uh -huh. or do everything that's be done. You know. So that's what basic thing. They have this level, and sometimes I say when I go to do sound check, I say we have to have where well, we start off this absolute pianissimo. We have to have this acoustic level that we can go to, that we can go up from there. Uh -huh. So don't give us too much electric so we can't get down there. Right. Well, there's that underlying thing that when you go down to the bottom of the bassy band, there's gonna always going to be Freddie. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and so consequently, they have to continually relate to that. And that creates a definite dynamic. Duke didn't play a lot of piano. Again, that would sometimes, and that was one of the things when I was listening to him, that whole band seemed to be resting on Jimmy Blanton. And so that was a dancing bottom that was happening in that band, uh -huh. you know? And uh, Sonny Greer played very unobtrusively, uh -huh. not commanding and demanding. Uh -huh. So consequently, you hear you had this, this line, not saying, don't, 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 but, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. <laughs> Dance the band, and Duke would just let it happen. You know what I mean? Play his little runs, his little introduction. Uh -huh. you know? I'll tell you a story about Duke. Uh, I'm in the Regal Theater. Young man, this is when the first time I, I got that close to him. So, you know, he was my number one influence, you know, so this was exciting for me. But I'm backstage, and, uh, you know, they have the half hour when the curtain comes down and everything. So, in the meanwhile, he's got all these stars in the band, almost everybody in every, somebody in every section of his was on the top of the downbeat pole. Johnny Hodges and Lawrence Brown, Ben Webster. No, Ben was not, no, no, this was, this was the band with Clark Terry and him. But there was Clark, of course, Johnny Hodges was still there. Uh, Harry Carney, all these leaders are still in the band. Uh, Louis Belson is in the band, oh, yeah. you know. So um, it's time for the show to go on, the half hour. The guy comes and rings the bell at half hour. Of course, there's no one in the theater at that particular time. I mean, backstage. Then they bring up the, the, the movie screen, and the other thing is the other curtain, uh, well, he's getting ready to come up. So we get into the 15 minutes, five minutes, all on. At that particular time, there's nobody on except Louis Belson. So when the curtains is coming up, Louis just starts to play. This uh -huh. is what Duke would do. I've seen Duke do the same thing. He's got something. If it's him by himself, you start. If it's two, he's got an arrangement for everything. You know, he does not get up tight. The show goes on, you know. So Louis just starts to play. These guys are just walking across the stage. The curtain is coming up, and they're walking invisibly across the stage, taking their time with their horns and stuff uh -huh. like that. Louis is solo, and, you know. When he gets enough of them out there, maybe six or seven, <laughs> you know, out there, then he hits it. They playing jam with Sam in unison. You know, I had the record at home. You know, and they're just playing. And meanwhile, Paul's solo is one is coming up. You know? uh -huh. Paul is coming up down from the basement. The band room is down in the basement. Here comes Paul creeping up the stairs. You know, they say, ba 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 da da dee da 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 da. He's just about the top of the stairs. Ba 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 ba. This is his solo. <laughs> he runs from the wings, <laughs> slides right into the microphone. <laughs> 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 Meanwhile, the guy backstage, the band is out there cooking. The, the, guy, the guy backstage is hollering, Duke, Duke. Now, Duke is upstairs in the raft or someplace uh -huh. in his dressing room, you know. The band is willing. Here comes Duke downstairs. <laughs> Fixes <laughs> his conflicts and stuff like that. I love it. He gets down to the bar and say hello to a few ladies. <laughs> like that. The band gets toward the end of the tune. Uh. And he gets toward the end of the tune. Duke strolls out and stands in front of him. He cuts the band off, walks over to the other side, 
plays a little introduction on the piano. The band struck up again. He got and walked right out the other side. <laughs> Socialize again. <laughs> so that, that band, you know, that band has something special. But th that's the thing that I noticed. The horn sections, they swung. So consequently, you can understand how this too is delivering something mm -hmm. as a component to the rhythm section, the rhythm section feeling like they, that they're holding this band up. So even though the both things functioned very well, that was an independence, mm -hmm. you know? And that affected, uh, you know, how Basie's style, of how he played. He, I don't need to pump this band and pound on them to uh -huh. make it happen. This band is just resting on, you know? So when we say, ow, people know we say it out. There's a contrast again, uh -huh. you know what I mean? Yeah. Because they're gonna come all the way down here and just let it ride. Uh-huh. You know. Uh-huh. Now that takes, that really takes listening. You know, you have to listen. Uh, you know, today a lot, of, a lot of youngsters today, they play too loud. Joe has a phrase, he says, if you can't hear the rest of the guys in the band, and maybe bass used to say this, Guy, cause I guess he in the city guy, but, but if you can't hear the rest of the people in the band, you are playing too loud. So again, you know, and that allows you to determine where that level is, because you come down, and if you come down so that you can hear, the whole thing comes down to a blending level. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the same thing like with the touch on the piano. If you're going to play complicated chords. It's not, it's a different effect to try to dig them into the piano as opposed to just play it so that you just draw the sound out of the piano. Then they will blend uh -huh. and you get a balanced, you know, a balanced attack. Uh -huh. Let me ask you, if you had to name for us uh, three of who you think uh, the all-time, your all-time favorite keyboard artist, you only get to pick three. <laughs> uh, I have to go... I have to go like influence. Okay, okay. Influence. Um, and I'd have to say that was Amit Jamal. I'd have to say Oscar Peterson, because Oscar actually took the time, Oscar turned the corner for me. In other words, prior to Oscar, I was out of that Duke Ellington mode, and I was like a background player. I didn't know pianists until I worked opposite him one week at the Blue Note and, and observed him and watched piano playing and that kind of a thing. But he took the time to talk to me on two or three occasions. At that time, he took time. He set the criteria for my technique then because I had had this operation and he could see that I was having a problem. And he stopped me. This was like 1953. And he and Ray Brown had just come out of, he had come, just come out of Canada. He and Ray Brown had teamed up, and they were doing a duo, actually. And uh, he took the time to stop me and, and, and explain some things to me about piano playing. Just two or three things on the table between the time that he was going on the stage and I'm coming off. I was with Flip Phillips and Bill Harris. He had just left the, the Woody Herman band. You know, and in that short time, he laid down a, a, a piano criteria for me that after that just sent me out leaps and bounds, you know? And Ahmed Jamal, who, again, he was so effective. He was one of the, like a, what you call a prophet in your own hometown, which doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Well, he was it. He, he was uh, in Chicago. When he came to Chicago, uh, uh, he came from Pittsburgh. But we, we sort of, um, I don't know if we adopted him or captured him. Cause <laughs> <laughs> we like to feel like he's from Chicago. And because Chicago is such a great musical place, for one thing, a lot of guys, all those guys that came up from Memphis and stuff, like George Coleman and all, and Harold Mabin, they almost feel like they're from Chicago because when they arrive, that's something <coughs> happened uh -huh. that, that in, their, in their musical experience. Well, when Omni got there, the same thing. This was present in people like Nat King Cole. We were all hearing that at the time, you know. But to have a person in person to come, and the first time I heard him, I mean, it was there when he was playing gigs with people before he formed the first trio, people were following him around tape recording him. <laughs> you know what I mean? And when he formed his first trio, the club he worked in, you couldn't get in there. Oh. You couldn't get in a little club 
it wasn't as wide as this and a long club like that. And him and Ray Crawford and uh, Eddie Calhoun. And that he had uh, formulated this technique even then. When he was playing with everybody else, he was in his playing. And then when he formed this trio, Eddie Calhoun has got the maraca, and he's playing. And Ray Crawford, instead of playing like this, he's playing on the box. A coon coon pop, a coon coon pop on the guitar. Mm -hmm. So here you got the guitar, he's not playing ching, 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 and he's not saying just doom, 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 doom. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you the truth, they had something going on there <laughs> that was unbelievable. So that was, again, a concept, a technique that was together. And he played more piano. Vernell Fournier was in my group, and he wrote Poinciano when he was in my group. Uh-huh. Because he wrote that rhythm, you know? And, uh, and I had played with uh, Israel Crosby at the Beehive. When I first went to the Beehive to play, Israel was there. Israel started going out with Benny Goodman and stuff like that. Uh, Vernell was still in my group, and Ahmed pulled him. But when he put them two together, and right now, I played last week, and the bass player said, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Israel had a sound and a melodic approach again, and Vernell's unique way to play. When they came to New York City, for instance, I had heard Vernell play when he came up, he came up from New Orleans. So he's another one that we sort of adopted in Chicago. He came up from New Orleans, and the first time I heard him play, we were on the west side, I walked in some club, and again, I could hear it right away. This cat had a way of playing the drums that was something else. In other words, it, the personality was there. I, was oh, well yeah, formed. A definite thing that it, and it, it was a combination of things. Because he, I sit to him, talked to him just recently, and he was, you know, when you start teaching people, ask you questions, you start to figure out how to explain this stuff. You don't explain it to your stuff long as you, long as you plan it. But when people start to peel it, I used to say, well, what it really is it, you know? Uh -huh. Because here he had this jazz thing, yeah. but he has this this Latin ability, you know, built in. And then underneath there, that was that New Orleans. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, uh -huh. that New Orleans power, strong beat, solid beat that was there. And he's breaking it up on top of these other things, uh -huh. you know? And uh, I began to see that that was there. And it's the same thing uh, uh, with Ahmed. They had that, that, that thing that they had with the underlying thing, you know? Uh-huh. So, let me tell you, we've had a marvelous time here discussing the history of jazz and piano technique with Norman Simmons, and we've been filming here for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive, and thank you very much. Thank oh, you, my Norman. third piano player before we go. Okay, real quick. Hank Jones. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hank Jones. Okay. Don't forget. My lady, my best friend, my foot's in the gas tank, and daddy coming home to you. What are we gonna do? <laughs> Why was I in such a hurry? That's easy. You see, she fixes this food. And I come home and I go in the freezer and I take this thing out and start to pour and we have two. Then we eat. <laughs>